for the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for April 17th, 2024. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the Chair of a Committee at their discretion and after consultation with the Staff Liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Zalowski? Present. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Whitstead? Present. Ms. Myers? Dr. Elmendorp? And we also have Ms. Blotner. Present. Dr. Kraft. And that's it. OK, thank you. Oh, I, Ms. Kraft just joined. OK, great. Um, Present. <laughs> <laughs> so you've called all, all staff, right, Ms. Yes. Kraft? OK. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may have a roll call vote. Assistants will state each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for being here and fitting this extra meeting into your schedule. And we're gonna get right started since we never seem to have any extra minutes for um, chit chat. So first we're gonna um, discuss and answer any questions about the ESAW curricula, assessments and materials of instruction contract. And Ms. Blattner is ready to answer any questions. Ms. Di Dr. Di Donato, I don't know if you want to get it started or not. No, I think we, we will just dive right in. Okie dokie. All right, so Ms. Blattner. Okay, well, I know that you had the pre-recorded or the narrated PowerPoint presentation. So I think I'll just highlight a couple of things that you need to keep in mind as we think about this. Um, again, during the narrate presentation, if you go ahead and click to the next slide, please. I try to frame the vision and when we think about what our multilingual learners need, it's really about ensuring that we are looking at the shared ownership of our multilingual learners. And I know that is the interest of the board, our superintendent and the larger team, which is why we are having this conversation today. So with that in mind, if you can go to the next slide. Again, just highlighting data, we have a large influx of students that are coming to the district. And as we have that influx, I'm also very cognizant of how long are students staying in the program. And so we really want to make sure that we have high quality instructional resources in place to ensure that our multilingual learners can develop that academic language and they can access the curricula, the content curricula. If you go to the next slide. Again, this is just showing you the data in a different way as far as enrollment by grade level. So this is very, really important for us to note that we do see a spike happen in grades nine and 10. If you go to the next slide. Again, this is just emphasizing when we look at performance, we, there are, here are our grad rates. And so we really want to make sure that we're preparing our multilingual learners so they can truly be college and career ready. So that I know is a critical um, point of focus for everyone involved, board members, all the way through down to our teachers. The next one, next slide please, just highlights again when we're looking at why this is so critical, looking at our data. 
um, all students are on your left hand side and on the right side are multilingual learners. So we really need to make sure those high quality instructional resources are in place for our multilingual learners. So with that, um, I think you had information about the resources. We were really looking for something that is high quality, ease of use for teachers. And in addition to that, we wanted to make sure that it's going to be engaging for our students. So all of these things were um, considered as we were looking at various products. If you continue to the next slide, this is just speaking to voices from the field. Again, what was of great note is the fact that our principals, our teachers, our department chairs all said we need well structured and highly effective curriculum resources. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and open it up for questions. Okay. Thank you. Board members, um, questions? Ms. Tuleski? Hi there. Thank you for sharing the information. I just have a question um, about instruction. I know that for high school math, um, the students um, have to be taught in English, um, which of course is a challenge with the difficulty of, of algebra. Um, so I was wondering, um, kind of, has anything been considered with that? I know it may be a state requirement in terms of how much English the teacher uses, but um, I know that when I was visiting at schools, that was a challenge that um, was shared. And then, of course, since you just shared the ELA data, um, if you can speak a little bit to how instruction works in balancing native language ver versus English as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Mrs. Solowski. So when we look at math, and I'm so glad you asked this question, we looked at the resources that were currently in place at both the middle school level and high school. There is a course right now called ESOL Math, and that course was really designed for students with interrupted education. Um, as well as newcomers. What we've done in collaboration with our math team is we have looked at the resources that are in place and we're realigning and adjusting, redesigning that course to make sure that it's aligned to illustrative math, so aligned to the grade level standards, and at the same time, making sure that we're considering for students who come with interrupted education that they have those additional supports. So this course will be in English, but we're looking at the standards that lead up to Algebra 1 readiness, and we're building the course in collaboration with our math team, working with an ELD teacher and a math teacher to make sure that the resources are in place. And as you know, it's not just about the resources, it's about the professional development and support. So that will be happening. So that was the question about math. So we're on that. And then we know additional professional development will be needed for our math teachers in algebra because we have multilingual learners that are sitting in um, geometry and we want them to get to Algebra 2 and Calc and Pre-Calc, right? So those are our interests when we think about where we want our multilingual learners to be able to access various courses. So that's going to be important for us. And then as far as our ELD, so we have a course sequence that allows us to make sure that those brand new students that come in receive instruction in English, but we build their academic language aligned to the WIDA standards. However, because especially at the high school level, some of our courses also earn English credit. We need to make sure we're aligning to those bodies of standards as well. So the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards are also important. So we're looking at that alignment. We also are exploring those opportunities to co-teach and how can we make sure that our multilingual learners are receiving that instruction in that grade level English course. So again, it's the resources being in place. It's making sure that we're providing the professional development, not only about the curriculum resources, but also around co-teaching. And what do, are those best practices, those research-based practices, and what do they look like? Thank you. Can I ask a brief follow-up question? Sure. Thank you. Um, so in the math class, it just happened to be on the screen when I was there was it was a word problem that was written in English mm -hmm. and I kind of put myself in the student's shoes okay could I understand this word problem if it was written in French or Arabic or what have you 
Um, so that was just this huge challenge that was expressed because the students cannot translate. Um, you know, I, I guess the math problem was, I don't know, seven lines of, of information. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you could speak briefly to navigating that for the students. Thank you. So one of the things that my team has been working on is providing PSYOP training, so that sheltered ins um, instruction observation protocol to content teachers. You all know that we're in the process of decentralizing our ESOL centers and sending students back to their home schools. So that's really important. So that training helps teachers identify what are those language objectives that connect to the content objectives. So that would be important. I don't know about that particular lesson, but we'd want to think about that. We need scaffolds and support. So instructional strategies such as, as you were talking about the word problem, word walls, visuals, um, looking at language frames that might that students might use to be able to explain their ideas and setting up those protocols for academic discourse in the math classroom. I do know when I look at the math um, curriculum, especially illustrative math, it's set up a slightly different way where they want children to engage and explore the math around a problem before the teacher is didactically teaching um, students. So we really want to make sure that we're honoring that they are because our students can think and even if they're doing it in their first language, they might have encountered that math and we don't want to make the assumption that they can't do the math. And so that's important. Sometimes I've seen some math teachers share ideas or they'll have students that might speak that first language do some support for students. So that's something we would also encourage word walls to be up and around. And so they're explicitly teaching vocabulary. But again, remember Remembering that the students need to engage with that math and so we're not assuming that we're going to automatically teach that vocabulary separately, but that might be a follow up that happens. So it happens in a variety of different ways. I'd have to visit that classroom in my time here in Baltimore County. I have been out to several math classrooms, part of certain math learning walks, and that's been really great and it's helping to inform the collaboration that's happening with Caselli, Mishinda and her team and our team. So it's going to be ongoing as we move forward throughout this year. OK, thank you. Thank you. Any um, and Miss Zaleski, maybe we need a presentation on the math piece. Um, if that's something that the committee is interested in or on the whole um, program. Are there any um, questions, further questions about the ELA ESOL curricula? Board members? I just have a quick comment. Yes, Ms. Pumphrey. Um, I just wanted to point out um, for both this and the other part of our agenda that I did see the materials posted on the website. I had questioned last time because they weren't there, so I did look and everything is posted there. So I just wanted to um, put that on the record and to uh, just say thank you for putting that up for the public to view. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Ms. Pumphrey. Other comments or questions from board members? OK, hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the ESOL curricula assessments and materials of instruction contract? It's a mouthful. So move. I think that was Ms. Stolowski. Is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Ms. Cox, may we have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The contract passes to the Contracts Committee. The next topic is textbooks, anthologies for English courses, grades six through 12. And it's a continuation of our discussion from our April 3rd meeting. And I think we have Ms. Shea, Dr. Kraft, maybe Ms. Wicks, and um, Dr. DiDonato. Um, so just to get us started, so we were able to go through the uh, full presentation uh, during the last curriculum committee. Um, meeting and uh, you know certainly we're trying to respond to some questions. Um, you know I think one of the biggest uh, outstanding uh, concerns was you know how are curriculums vetted and evaluated even prior to piloting them within a district. 
Um, and so in, in talking with um, the team, I know that uh, Dr. Kraft um, has done a lot of investigation with regards to not just what Ed reports tells us about um, the curriculum, but as other sources. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to her for a moment to talk about that, um, because I think then the, the next is just to really tell you a little bit more about our rollout plan and then see if uh, you know there's additional questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what we did in response is we are working with each of the vendors to get um, any white papers they have, meaning they did not put that it's not their independent their research, but it's an independent company that has um, evaluated their company. Um, so they will have that all, um, to me by mid next week. Um, and additionally, um, some of the sources, not all of them, but uh, four of the sources that we use when we were originally looking at them, in addition to Ed reports, we have put together for you into one document. Um, and so, um, Dr. Donato, are we going to just drop that in the chat? Are we going to send that through the board? Uh, how are we going to get that out? So, I maybe we get that to Ms. Cox, and then she can work yes. um, with Ms. Gover to oh, to get to, that to, to the board members. Yep. It. So what we have done is we've actually hyper, so you don't have to go anywhere yourself. We've hyperlinked it. So we put, so the chart basically is uh, the name of the program, what grade level or grade level band, and then um, four different state reports um, that have gone through a, a very extensive review process of the product. So uh, we have that available for you. And then we just wanted to see what other questions um, that we could answer for you at this time um, after our, our last meeting and having some time to think about it. So we are open to any questions that you have. And then if we feel like we've answered our questions, we can talk a little bit about implementation. OK, thank you. Um, Ms. Dominowski, is that you have a question? I just had one question um, concerned because I've, I've heard some, some concerns about again about the, um, the HMH and the literature not using whole novels. Um, is that something that you can confirm or deny or explain further? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I neither confirm nor deny. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, so actually all three do use novels and what we've been doing is because we have novels that our teachers have been using that do align to the themes, we are actually starting with the novels that we already have and we already own, which is also just very fiscally responsible. It also gives teachers a level of comfort because instead of everything changing, hey, I've already taught this novel before. So uh, we're going to be aligning our novels. We're actually not going to recommend purchasing of new novels at this moment moment until we decide on the one that we're going forward with. Again, just because it's not fiscally responsible to align novels that we might not use after one year. So we're going through every single novel that we know that we've purchased for schools that they already own, and we're saying, hey, this aligns to this unit. So um, our expectation is a minimum of one novel per quarter, and that doesn't change. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions from board members? Ms. Booker Dwyer, do you have a question? I do. Uh, thanks, Ms. Lichter. So I have a question just about um, just ensuring that the, the novels and the textbooks and everything reflects the cultural diversity of the students. And, you know, so could you just speak a little bit to that and, and just reflect, you know, all interest styles, like I'm thinking of certain graphic novels and all of that. So could you just talk a little bit about how you all are ensuring that the novels, um, the students see themselves in the novels and textbooks that are selected. OK, so you're speaking my language now. Um, so this is, actually what my, <laughs> this is what my dissertation was on, so I am going to try to be brief and succinct, but cut me off at any point if you have way too much information. Um, so I'm actually going to um, back up four years um, and uh, say that in 2020, um, right around the time that we had, um, if you all remember, we had a BCPS uh, discussion about race and racism, and then there were some student comments such as uh, you just referenced maybe not seeing themselves in the curriculum. And so we actually did an entire audit of our curriculum at that time. Now, obviously, with a, adopting a new curriculum, the work that we've done actually is not wasted. And in fact, one of my team members said to me, um, because at the end of every year, I, you know, I, I mean, I meet with them all the time, but at the end of the year, I have an end of the year conference. And, you know, I talked about, you know, how did you grow this year? How can I support your growth? What are your goals? And one of them said the, the audit 
was the best. So they said schooling, PD, anything they ever had, because they said, now I can't unsee things, right? So things that before we might not have seen as problematic or just even thinking about like, who are we not including, right? Who's not here? Who's been silenced? Who's been marginalized? Who have we represented in a stereotypical way? All of that um, work that's been done has made us better in the work that we do. So when we went to evaluate all the products that came in, so any vendor that uh, replied um, to the RFI through the 6002 policy, uh, we, one of our criteria was that it does reflect the diverse uh, diversity of our population uh, and the pluralistic nature of society, right? So going back to some of our board policy also. And so we, that was one thing that we did look at. Now, novels are a chance for us to supplement if there isn't, if we see some holes in the curriculum that we're piloting. So at a base level, we did already look for that. However, I will tell you that in general, publishers haven't quite caught up to what I would say is a high level of uh, inclusion of all student identities. And so the novels give us a chance to put other things in place for students to be able to read. And so we will continue to do that. And um, and many of you were here when we brought to you um, the eight different novels that we've added in the last few years. Um, and they were all in response to what was missing in the curriculum, who wasn't represented. And so those novels will continue over as we um, adopt our new curriculum um, and part of our work this summer is going to be saying again is there something that's missing and so um, we're really i mean that's part of our work that's part of our commitment um, that's part of you know what we um is a bedrock of what we do is ensuring that students are able to see themselves in the text and so um, I'll stop there um, if I missed any part of it, but um, I, I know that um, I could talk about this all day. Dang, I just want to add, add one quick thing. Oh, thank um, you. To, to Ms. Booker Dwyer's question, though, because I want to connect it to your earlier response to Ms. Dominowski about we're also only talking about four novels in a year. And so one of the things that's important, as Dr. Kraft described, about it being an iterative process is you also don't want to just have a single story. So mm -hmm. even though we've identified particular identities that may have been missing, just picking one novel has the danger of action um, reinforcing um, that that's a single story. So it's an iterative process that we keep on growing. Um, ultimately, we support teachers using the whole novel approach of even allowing student choice mm -hmm. so that even within that, um, there's opportunity for that pluralistic approach. Um, and besides looking at racial identities, I also heard you reference different types of um, reading. So we know that students have interest in lots of different types of um, writing, both nonfiction fiction, you mentioned graphic novels. Um, the graphic novels are increasing in complexity, so that's always a part of it. We want to make sure that the novels address the standard, but that they also reflect the complexity or the rigor of the standard. Um, but that's a part of this process, too, is that we're constantly expanding those opportunities um, to build that out. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you for that. I knew you all were on top of it. <laughs> Other questions? This is not like us. OK, um, you <laughs> but we do not need to vote because we're not at that point yet. Correct, Dr. DiDonato? There's no contract about any of the pilots yet. The, right. Yes, the contract um, will come at our May um, curriculum committee meetings um, to go to the board in June. OK, all right, so we do not need to vote on that. OK. OK, so those were our two um, big topics, except we have another topic to talk about. And I'm going to um, switch over I thought, and whoops. Are we, I thought um, I'm sorry. I thought um, Dr. DiDonato said she was going to discuss the rollout or no. Oh, okay. yes, we can absolutely do that. OK, go ahead. just go over right. it really quick. I'm sorry. Is that OK? Yeah, we have yeah. time. No, we're, doing, we're good. We're good on okay. time. You don't usually say Dr. that. Dr. Kraft, do you know what not slide yeah. number that might be on? Um, can we go all the way to the end, um, please, Mr. Corns? Um, it should be, um, I don't have a slide number right in front yeah. of me, but it will be one of the last two slides. Um, and so, you know, thank you uh, for coming back to the, oh, <laughs> yep, um, go one more slide up. Um, 
So um, right now, you know, we're in the process of, so just a look back that we have uh, made sure we already had our first curriculum night where we had the parent preview. Uh, we did our first PLD where we were very specifically looking at the three products. Um, we had our public notice and display, which is actually still on um, display. So even though we said um, April 3rd, we've extended that. Um, and then we did have a DC informational drop in meeting, which we actually had a, a, a huge number of our DCs uh, come to that. Um, and then uh, we had our monthly department chair meeting where we continued to talk about high quality instructional materials. And then, of course, we were with you um, on April 3rd. Um, next slide, please. And so what we have coming up now as we start to think about our implementation timeline is um, obviously was the second round to make sure that we really are comprehensively answering your questions. Um, and um, Mr. Corns, do you mind going one more slide up? Um, and so um, and so we did notify schools um, on April 8th. So uh, at this point, um, you know, we have split the 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 school, well, DRAA split the schools, um, uh, thinking about geography, student demographics, um, uh, size, all, all kinds of things. They put them in three equal groups. We've informed the schools. Um, and so what we're, what's coming next is at the last PLD, we actually uh, brought all the middle and high school principals together and we did a joint session with math, ELA and ESOL around high quality instructional materials and what the leadership was that was necessary to really fully um, implement high quality instructional materials at, at a very high level. And so what was really just such a beautiful moment was math was able to talk about, you know, reflections on what they learned in terms of implementing a high quality instructional material and the participants, the principals were able to say what what were the things I wish I would have known? What were the things that I needed to do this successfully? So we were able to get um, literally probably 14 poster filled posters of ideas. And so we're putting that together and that actually comes as part of our implementation plan now because they're telling us, hey, this would have been more successful for us if we had had that. And so we're still in the process of, I would say, I, I'm actually calling our implementation plan a drafty draft. Um, I certainly, if we're coming back again, I can bring it to you all. Um, it will be less drafty next month um, because we were really trying to capture that principal voice. Uh, on May 17th, we will be meeting with our department chairs and we are going to do a very similar process to what we did with the um, principals. We're going to have them read the, an article that talks about um, the lessons uh, of, of lifting a high quality instructional material as a leader and what you need to do. And we're going to give them that um, presentation and we're asking them between May 17th and June 24th to do it with their department. Because then on June 24th, we will begin training on the specific products. And so they will have some time that I'm calling macro level training of like, here's the curriculum, here's how it's laid out, here's how we use it, asking questions, navigating the platform. Then there will be a chunk of time where they actually get to back map their first unit and really understand what are the standards, what am I looking at, what kinds of things do I need. Um, and of course, you can only plan to a certain point because you don't have your students yet. But just to know what that flow is and what standards are in that first unit, as well as looking at the novels that are associated with that unit. In July, we will actually be meeting with um, administrators. We have we don't have the exact date yet, but we are going to um, give them an overview of the product and um, how they can support it. Um, and then um, when we come back for pre-service week, uh, any teacher that did not get trained June 24th and 25th, there will be time during that uh, week before school begins to make sure that everybody's been trained and it is part of our NEO um, for brand new teachers to the district. Um, moving forward from there, September is a blackout month, meaning that we're not pulling teachers for professional learning or additional meetings, um, but start. But they will have plenty to, they'll have already had professional learning and they'll have plenty to do that first month. Then starting in October, we will have a learning progression uh, to help 
helps support everyone. In addition, because we are piloting different products, we are going to have um, both um, focus groups and surveys after every quarter. So people don't have to wait till the end of the year and remember what they did or didn't like or what they did or didn't need. Or if there's a, a gap we can fill in immediately, that's why we'll collect that data every single quarter to make sure teachers have what they need or what the challenges are. Can we help address them? Um, and so that's a very high level. But if you have any specific questions, I, de I definitely can delve down deeper. But I just that's kind of the high level of, of what will happen. One quick so thing I want to add. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, 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 no you first. So just to give an, uh, an update to the Board of Ed on um, April 16th, it's going to be Curriculum Committee on um, May 2nd, Contracts Committee May 6th, and then it will go to the June 11th board meeting. Just to yeah, give you an update on this timeline. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Mache? Um, I was just going to add because you mentioned it briefly, but where you see on April 8th that we notified schools, we also posted in Schoology access to the curriculum for every teacher. So the teachers have had since April 8th the ability to start checking these things out. They can look at the materials online, they can see the scope and sequence, and they can start to explore. Um, many teachers, um, especially many of our early adopters, are super excited mm -hmm. and have already been emailing us, um, identifying specific texts that they've seen or different essential questions or even in some cases talking about ideas they already have so um, that's what we know and love about our teachers is they get super excited so I just wanted to unpack a little bit where it says teacher curriculum access and that was for teachers special educators ESOL teachers supporting them as well as administrators um, so in the same day that they got the email letting them know to which group they had been assigned they got access um, to the curriculum and really they got access to all three. Um, yes. They just obviously went right for the one that they had been assigned. Um, Ms. Shea, thank you um, for saying that. And I wanna add to what you said, in addition to getting access to the curriculum, they each had an asynchronous PD that they could watch and rewatch um, that navigated them to the curriculum, the platform, um, how to read the scope and sequence. And so obviously we're going to do live professional learning, but in the meantime that they knew how to navigate the curriculum platform they had been given. Thank you. Any follow up questions from committee members? I just have a comment. Go ahead, Ms. Mumphrey. I remember now. Oh, I think uh, I was trying to remember what I was going to say. My thought. Um, I just wanted to. I appreciate the um, the um, pre this presentation far in advance, uh, and then we'll have another opportunity again. But just I think this allowed us to ask um, questions, and then you came back to us with some follow up answers. And so that, I think that was very important in our work um, as a committee to sort of get, you know, some follow up answers to questions that we previously previously asked about the vetting. Um, and I just wanted to comment on that and thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Anybody else? OK, so the last part of our meeting tonight um, and most of you, I think, were at the board meeting last night or listening to it maybe um the board right now is um under our committees are are going through a um relook at that's not the right word miss booker dwyer so you can fill in <laughs> you can fill in a better word for me but we are um kind of analyzing um our committees our committee structure as well as the purpose for each of the committees and then what is our measure of effectiveness so we are going to um start i'm going to now share we're going to start the discussion now um, and I have some slides to share with you um, and then I'll give you some time. We'll have a discussion and give you some time to think about it um, and then we'll come back and finalize it at our next meeting on May on May 2nd. I think our next meeting is um, and then we'll be presenting um, our thoughts to the full board on May 7th. I may have gotten the exact dates wrong, but it, it, it does work. Um, so let me share. Um, let's see if I shared it. OK, nope. Hmm. So you still see what's on the thing, right? You see my screen or. OK, you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. OK, so let me now go to. OK, um, so we all each committee has a form that looks something like this that we will fill out. I had two things that I knew. One was that um, Dr. Di Donato 
um, as chief academic officer is our staff liaison. Um, and then we can talk about meeting dates, times and topics. Um, but right now our meetings are usually monthly or by, or twice a month um, from 430 to 6. Um, but we really want to work on right now is the purpose and the measures of effectiveness. So these were the these are the questions um, that Chair Booker Dwyer has posed to us as far as what are the purpose and goals of each committee? How is the work of this committee advancing the school system and supporting improved student outcomes? And is there a different format needed to better address the intent of the committees? So just wanted to give you those um, overarching questions as we move into talking about the purpose. So I pulled out what is included in the current um, Board of Education handbook. There's a section in there about committees and each of the committees has a defined purpose. And ours um, says the following, um, the curriculum committee reviews new or revised curriculum as well as courses and materials presented by staff. In those instances where materials approved by this committee require purchases, the contracts are also presented to the building and contracts committee. And then the second bullet is really just talking about the frequency, which I just spoke about at least monthly, um, additional meetings, which we certainly have done, have been added. And the chief academic officer is the lead executive leadership staff member for this committee. Um, so going back to the purpose, what's on the screen is the purpose that's currently in our handbook, and that's what we're looking at either keeping, changing, revising. Um, so if we go to the next one, so, um, and Dr. Dinanad and I had a conversation about this um, during one of our planning meetings just to kind of get the ball rolling. So, um, and I think it was after our last meeting or not, but we talked about the number of contracts that come through the curriculum committee and often some of them um, are very quick. Like if you think about our meeting last time, we had equipment for music. Um, I think we had deaf and hard of hearing interpreters um, and we had the one about the BC, um, I'm gonna say it wrong, BCBABs. BCABs. Oh, so close. Um, and then we had the secondary ELA and we had the ESOL. Um, those first three at our last meeting, we did we did right away. The other two took a long a longer time. So we were trying to even think about um, are all of our topics or all the contracts that are coming, do they need to come through us as a curriculum committee um, or not? When I look at what it, we talk about um, in our committee, the curriculum, we're usually focusing on the content. We don't talk about the contract, the, the, the items that are listed on the contract. That's what the contract committee usually focuses on. But often um, the contracts committee will ask some of the same questions um, about content that the curriculum committee does. So sometimes there is redundancy where I'm sure staff feels like they're answering the same question um, in two different meetings. And one thing, um, and Chair Booker Dwyer spoke last night about really making sure that we're use, effectively using the time of, time of staff. So um, that's the kind of focus that we've had at curriculum committee is really more on the content piece. So, you know, should it continue as is it meaning the curriculum committee committee or should we define the scope of contracts um, presented to curriculum committee? So one thought that we had was maybe we um, condense the scope and ideas were should this committee still be talking and looking at brand new curriculum? instruction or assessment. So if it's the first time it's coming to um, the board, um, then we would vet it during curriculum committee. Um, if it's core or tier materials align with superintendent's priorities. So she clearly has four priorities for instruction and those um, contracts would come through our committee. Um, and then well as professional learning for staff. So if we think about like the music contract that we discussed last time and staff put the PowerPoint together, that wouldn't fit in these because it's not, um, music is not one of the four priorities. It was not a new um, curriculum or a new materials. It was um, another, I think, another iteration of it. Um, and it wasn't about professional learning. The same thing for the deaf and hard of hearing interpreters when we went through that one, that one wouldn't fit into those three criteria, but the ELA materials or 
a new math curriculum, all of those would be um, part of it. Again, this was just to get a discussion started and it was just Dr. DiDonato and I kind of brainstorming if we wanted to narrow the focus um, as evidenced by a lot of our meetings running so long, how would we narrow it? Um, and that's some of the things we came up with. Um, Measures of effectiveness, that's where we need to kind of think through how are we proving or measuring that our committee is being effective. Um, and then I want to get thoughts from you guys, um, from the committee and staff. And then just to let you know, next steps would be for you to kind of consider this discussion. Send me any thoughts or ideas um, before our next meeting. I would then put your ideas into the slides and then we could finalize it then. Um, so, um, let me see something. I would like to see people. Here we go. Um, so, tell me what you're thinking. So, if we go back to um, thoughts about the curriculum committee, um, the overlap with the contracts committee, and um, what are your thoughts, Miss Pumphrey? Sorry, it took me a second to unmute. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. Hopefully I can remember them all. As far as the um, duplication and repetitiveness um, with contracts committee and the questions that we are asking and the properties of staff's time, I think some of that could be resolved by our reporting out as a committee. Um, and I would say that in general, not just for this committee, but for committees in general, that when we're reporting out to the board about our curriculum meetings, uh, maybe add some additional information to be a bit more specific so that the questions aren't um, asked again. I know sometimes, however, the timing of that may be off. So, you know, if we're asking questions in curriculum and we're not reporting out to the board before the contracts committee um, with the same presentation, um, that may not be helpful. So I'm not sure timing wise the best way to do that, but I think some of that can, could be resolved by our reporting um, as far as, you know, what we're doing as a committee. Okay, yeah, I think the timing is what would get us because they do the contracts the night before they're presented at the board meeting. So, like, if I had talked about last night, the contracts were already approved. So that would take some um, timeline adjustments for um, contracts too, I think. Yes, so just, I was just a, just a thought. Right. I'm not sure how the right. dynamic that work, but that was just a thought. Um, and when you say reporting out, would tell me more about what reporting out would look like. Um, so, an example would be, I, I, I don't, I, to bring up, an, I don't, in last night's meeting, the way Rod, this is an example I'm thinking of, the way Rod discussed, talked about what they talked, what they discussed in audit, so that we knew as a board what they discussed. So I didn't have to go back and watch the audit meeting to know the general overview of what they discussed in that meeting. Right, I mean, he listed the names of the audit reports, but would that, if I just listed the contracts that we discussed, would that be enough? Probably not. Um, so not specific details. I'm sorry, my thoughts are not specific details. That's maybe a broad, okay, so we talked about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a broad example. We talked about professional development um, for teachers as far as the new ELA curriculum. Um, that so just the topics, sort of like the yeah, broad topics, not too specific, maybe with a little, a few details. If it's something that's important that contract, the contract committee might want to know that we um, discussed in curriculum, that type of thing. Okay, thank you for that. Other and um, I did like the I did like your idea about the focus is the three focuses that you listed for right. um, for it to come the contracts to come in front of committee instead of because I do feel like we get some. Some contracts thrown in that we don't necessarily need to discuss um, during our curriculum meetings. Okay, thank you for that. Other um, comments? Ms. Nobody? Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes, yeah, so I, I like your idea, uh, Ms. Lichter, of you know just having that clear focus that we're only going to focus on the curriculum. So I have two ideas. So one is you know, I like that approach where we're only going to focus on the curriculum content and it's going to be, you know, this certain scope, the parameters that you laid out for it. I think that would be really, really helpful and it'll really help keep 
this committee focus and it'll be an added value because now we know when it goes to contracts, they're only focused on the mechanics of the contract. Um, so I like that approach. I think that would be great. Um, and another approach would also be, you know, if we could we look at the mechanics of the contract. So if we focus on the so if something comes to the curriculum committee, could it be both contact contracts, the um the the scope, content. the content and the mechanics of the contract, and then it goes to the board if it's like it doesn't even need to go to the buildings and contracts committee. Oh. Uh, um, we could do everything in house. Um, so that's just another thing, another way to think about it, and then it can go to the full board to have the bigger discussion for the vote. Okay. So that's either okay. way, I think would be uh, would be really helpful. Okay. All right, so you're saying do the limit the scope, but then the ones we do look at, look at it for both reasons, content and mechanics. Doesn't no, go to think, curriculum, doesn't go to board, I mean, doesn't go to the contracts committee. It would just go to the board for. I know I'm saying or like a two, you know, we can decide as a as a group, whatever the this committee decide lands on, that either we only focus on the, the content as you laid out and there's certain oh. parameters. And so that's one approach we could do. Or the second approach could be we're looking at everything. And okay. once we say this is good to go, it can go right to the full board. Gotcha. OK, so, for example, the music thing, would we would have looked at it, looked at the mechanics of the contract, doesn't go to um, contracts committee, just goes to the full board for approval. Right. OK. All right. Thank you. Any other thoughts or ideas? Dr. Dita and I don't have to put you on the spot, but it's important. I think it's important that we get staff input too, just because you're such a vital part of it. And you already added the work of doing the PowerPoints for us, which I think is a, is a huge help because in the very beginning when we met as a committee, we didn't do that. And then we weren't getting through anything. So we're already asking staff to do those PowerPoints. So we want to be cognizant of the work that you guys are doing. So, oh, I see Ms. Solowski's hand. Did you okay. want to turn to her and then I can yes. talk and uh, call and stuff? Okay. Yes, Ms. Stolesky, what's your thoughts? Thank you. So first of all, I think in this committee, just as an aside, we really have amazing discussions and um, the staff members come really well prepared. It's such a, a learning experience for the board members, but I really do feel that our time is very productive. So thank you to everybody who contributes to that. Um, I like Ms. Lichter and Ms. Booker Dwyer's ideas about just minimizing using two committees to approve the obvious com uh, contracts. I think also in addition, either way would be fine, but I do think it's a good idea to um, avoid having to use two committee meetings. And then just finally, I don't know if this would help, but I just thought of this if after committee meetings for even for all of the committees, um, the chair or vice chair or whoever runs the meeting just sends a really brief bulleted summary of what was discussed. And then um, that would just go to all the board members and then they would have time to possibly think about it before the next board meeting. So that was just one possible idea I had to communicate with all of the board members about what was discussed. OK, thank you. So you agree with the idea of minimizing the work of two committees, but um, and then maybe the addition of the brief bulleted summary of what is discussed. Um, what would be good to add, but I don't want to make more work, is on that um, summary is if we had like the time stamp of when that item was discussed. So if somebody wanted to get more information, they don't have to watch the whole thing, they could go right to that part, but that might be a little, a little much. So, um, okay, Dr. Donato, what were you thinking? So I guess um, in looking at sort of like the purpose and roles of the committee, so mm -hmm. I, I would say that I would not want um, to be like the final reviewer of a contract here without someone then from like purchasing on the call, because I think, for example, last night at the board meeting, there, there was a question about um, the term of a contract, like five years, and that's not. Miss Myers doesn't didn't go and say like I want an ABA contract for five years. That's just pr 
practice in VCPS. Mm -hmm. And I certainly couldn't, I mean, I just know that's what's on ours. I couldn't answer justification as to why, and I really would have relied on purchasing. So I think if we go that route, my only consideration would be that there would need to be someone from like purchasing as part of that. And then does that sort of blur the lines between both of them also? So that would just be my consideration because I think there are contract, contract, technical contract questions that come up that I don't think I would feel comfortable sort of just answering. That's a good point. Thank you for that. Other Share, thoughts? Mr. Craft, you guys want to add? You're you're here all the time, also. Ms. Dominowski, do you have something or? Sorry. No, I was just going to say that I, I, I at first I was kind of agreeing with that we'd be like a one stop shop for some of these con curriculum contracts, but then to, the way that if we added at the end, um, you know, setting out an update like, hey, this is what we went over. So especially to the contract to me, like we went exclusively extensively into this contract. So you just really need to go over the mechanics of it. If you have questions about anything else, here's where you can, you know, so that way. And, and, and if you bring you have to bring in someone from purchasing, then it's kind of like you're not really reducing the workload. You're it's, it's still the same as far as, you know, anyway, that was just my thoughts. OK, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, is your hand up again or did not take it down? Yes. Yes, nope, it's up again. OK, and, that's fine. <laughs> and, and I was just thinking about like the measures of effectiveness for mm -hmm. this. So if we had some type of decision matrix, and I think that would also help the staff to say that if you're bringing something to us to look at for curriculum, then we need certain data points. Um, I know Ms. Stileski sent an email um, with some things, with some um, recommended data points, but if we came up with something like that, so that way when staff comes to present, they know what information that we're going to need to make that decision. And so then we could use as a measure of effectiveness that we are using that agreed upon decision matrix to, um, you know, to be the lens upon how we're saying this curriculum should move forward to the full board for consideration or not. OK, can you just give me an example of something that may be included in that matrix? Right, so so we would want like data on um, on the, the previous use of that curriculum from school districts that are similar to ours, that are similar in size, similar in demographic demographics. What was the effectiveness of that curriculum? Um, what did the teacher say from those from those school districts on the rollout of that curriculum um, so that we would have that information um, going in? So that would be like, and we could wordsmith it, but it would be something like that where we would know the previous data and the um, the effectiveness of the, the implementation. And then what were some of the challenges to how other districts have rolled this curriculum out and how is Baltimore County going to proactively address those challenges. So I'm thinking that we may need two matrix, one for new curriculum and then one for existing curriculum that may need increased spending authority or renewal or, or whatever it is. So um, it, we may need two of them. But thank you for that um, thought. M Ms. Shea. Hi, um, I, I was going to offer first, I really appreciate the idea of efficiency. Sometimes when as a staff member, I'm in a meeting, I'm like, didn't we do this already? And I have like a deja vu. So I really appreciate the effort to be more streamlined because your time is um, extremely valuable, too. And I know you want us focused on kids and teachers. Um, I think I was going to say something very similar to where I thought Miss Booker Dwyer was going, which is twofold. You know, obviously I'm entering this as a teacher and we often use a rubric and tell the students the rubric at the beginning of the assignment. So what I heard Mr. Booker Dwyer also talking about is almost having a frame of for every presentation that staff is bringing to curriculum committee. These are the five to six things that you're going to want included because then that's something that can become universal that we know up front when we bring anything to you, you're going to want to know X, Y, and Z, right? And and that's what I heard Miss Booker Dwyer um, talking to, because I think that's really beneficial for us to have a frame. 
Um, and certainly it can be nuanced based on the purpose, because I also want to offer sp there's space in the curriculum committee to bring things to you that we're not actually looking for permission about anything. We're just trying to educate and share and sometimes celebrate because that's an important part of this community too. this committee to be an avenue for um, stakeholders to know about the curriculum and to understand what we're doing for students. And so I wouldn't want to only narrow it to things that are eventually going to be contracts, but to also have an opportunity. Um, and so that could be sort of if you think about this matrix idea to piggyback on what Ms. Booker Dwyer say, depending on the purpose of the presentation, right? So there'd be what is the purpose of the presentation? And then based on that purpose, what are your expectations as a committee for the types of information you're going to want to know so we can anticipate? Believe it or not, we do that anyway, based on the history of this committee. We try to anticipate what kinds of questions you're typically going to ask us. And so we have internally tried to be proactive and say, well, they're going to ask about professional learning and they're going to ask about communication timelines. So it would just be great if that was transparent between us. Um, and then the last thing I was going to offer is um, we post our presentations a week prior, and I know you might get questions from other stakeholders. I think knowing those before the meeting allows us to do any type of homework or checking or number crunching. So if that could be a part of the process that if you get uh, questions, um, letting us know so that we can come to the meeting prepared to answer them because sometimes they need us to talk to someone else or to look somewhere else and it's just a time saver. OK, thank you for that. I'm visualizing this frame matrix. Um, Dr. Kraft. Uh, so some of some of what I was going to say is duplicative of what Megan Amache just said. Um, so I do think that have I think when I think about what curriculum committee does and what contracts um, does it is different. You both are coming in from a different frame of reference. And so a little bit like Ms. Shaywood said, like in curriculum committee, here's the things that we need to see, right? These are the things that we are providing feedback, collecting feedback from stakeholders, um, that type of a thing. Um, whereas in contracts, it is slightly different, like Dr. Donato said, in terms of like length of contract, you know, uh, di different pieces that they are probably looking at. And so I think if we can even delineate um, that we're not just repeating a presentation. So what we show you in curriculum committee is different than maybe what we're highlighting in contracts. But I think there is a place for both. Um, and um, and just to not not just to repeat everything that Ms. Jay said, but also I think there is a place where I don't want to just bring contracts to you. So when we have other successes of things that we're doing, that I, you know that there is a space to say, hey, we're starting to see some uh, real academic growth uh, through this use of this curricular uh, resource or initiative um, or collaboration. And so um, I just wanted to offer that. So thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Pumphrey? Uh, just again, I, I agree with um, Ms. Booker Dwyer and Ms. Shea, both our assessment as far as the matrix. Um, I think that we are often asking some of the same questions, which I know staff also anticipates and prepares, but if we could have something formal like a matrix, I, I'm in agreement. I think that would make things kind of streamline the process because um, when we do have new curriculum and we're looking at new curriculum, we're asking the same questions and that format I think would help with the efficiency of the meetings. Thank you for that. Any other th thoughts about? Um, I mean, as far as a purpose statement, the one that's in there, I think we're just talking more logistics. Probably is still OK. Um, we're just kind of narrowing it down, but measures of effectiveness. Um, Ms. Booker Dwyer talked about the use of the matrix as one possible measure. Are there any ideas of other? measures of effectiveness. Christina, did you just raise your hand again? OK, oh, no, sorry, I didn't I didn't um, lower my hand. <laughs> That's OK. Other ideas about measures of effectiveness. OK, so I oh, uh, no, go ahead. My hand. Oh. So oh. in no, my. No. Uh, and so I know that like the whole piece around like attendance, I because I was going through some other things, but I know we're baking some things into our board board self evaluation 
Um, so I'm just kind of going through trying not to be redundant with what we may put in the self-evaluation as a whole, as far as like our attendance to committee meetings and that kind of things. Um, but I'll think through some more now that we've had this discussion um, and I'll, I'll send you some some other ones. I'll sit and, and think through some more now that I've, we've had this discussion. Um, my brain is kind of working now. I got it. It's 530. So um, and one thing is, I, I do want to say that this committee, we have really had wonderful attendance for all of our meetings, even as we've added additional meetings. So I really appreciate everybody's um, commitment to coming and then also, you know, doing the homework first and then being able to ask um, questions. So what I think I want to do, it's 530 and it's it's our brain capacity. We had a late meeting last night. Um, is diminishing is I want to kind of take all the notes that you all said your thoughts um, put them back into something and then send them to you for further consideration to think through this discussion um, and then we'll come back at our next meeting and kind of finalize it before this committee takes it to the full board um, at the first May meeting is that okay as far as next steps yes, yes. okay Good me. all right let me get my script back um, I had it up. OK, here it is. So is there any further business? <laughs> I think we did that since there's no further business. Oh, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next curriculum committee meeting will be held on May 2nd, 2024. So if you could send me your thoughts about that at least a day ahead so I can um, include it um, for the presentation. And, and since there's no further business, this meeting is now adjourned. And thank you everybody for coming to this added meeting. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Have a good evening.